Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of Cognitive Dissidence. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Joining us for our weekly chat is Rob Larity. Um, we've listened to some of your feedback. I'm, I'm making these episodes a little bit less focused on nitty gritty of day to day markets and more pulling back and trying to see the macro perspective and see where markets and geopolitics are interacting with broader societal forces and things like that. So. Uh, we spend a little bit of time talking about the news that broke just as we were recording about a potential Iran-U.S. deal um, around oil and um, uranium enrichment before uh, turning to looking at our projections from January 2023 and where they're at at the halfway point of the year and then trying to project forward and see what's going to happen through the rest of the year. We then close with some thoughts about a really excellent article in Nature uh, called The Illusion of Moral Decline. Link to that is in the comments. Um, listeners, if you want to talk more about the wealth management services that we offer our clients, if you want to talk more about the research services that we provide to corporate executives, um, or if you just want to talk to me about what's going on in the world, or you have a book to recommend or a podcast guest to recommend, you can email me at jacob at cognitive.investments. A lot of you have been uh, taking advantage of that lately, and I've been trying to respond to all of you. I read everything that comes through, even if I can't re reply to absolutely all of it, but I do my best to reply to all of it. So thanks for being in touch with me and making this feel not just like I'm talking into a computer screen every day, but like a community of listeners. It's um, It's been an immensely gratifying experience having this podcast grow and having a community of people who really care about apolitical um, a geopolitical analysis and a discourse that is about trying to figure out what's going on in the world and not scoring points against each other for ideological reasons. So uh, with that, Saccharin, thank you out of the way. Cheers and see you out there. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor. Rob, I'm going to start off with... Um a joke that I, I was exposed to recently. I've heard this joke many times before, but I, I read it again last night. I just want to tell it to you because it's so great and it really sort of describes where I'm at in my head right now. So a guy is walking down the street and he passes an insane asylum. I don't know what the politically correct word is for that these days, but so he, he passes a, an insane asylum and he hears all of these people out in the yard chanting, 21, 21, 21. It's very curious. So he goes over and he tries to peek into the yard, but everything's blocked off and things like that. But there's a little slit uh, where if he can just get to it, he can maybe peer into the thing. And 21, it's getting louder and louder and louder. And he goes and he peers into the little slit and boom, a stick points, pokes him in the eye. And suddenly he starts hearing 22, 22, 22. <laughs> That's sort of where my mental and spiritual state is right now. How are you doing? This, this is pretty good. It's pretty good. I'm doing well. Um, um yeah. Yeah. No, that's. I'm just thinking about your joke. <laughs> well, that's good. I hope you think about it for a while. I'm saying it in part because um, you know today we're going to zoom back a little bit again. We're going to talk about the year so far because we're we're remarkably at the halfway point of the year and talk about the year ahead and also talk about a really interesting article in Nature, which is maybe the most important thing I've read this week. But I wanted to start with the 20 second stick in the eye because right before we went on to record, um, a publication called Middle East Eye is talking about a deal, or at least negotiations on a potential deal between Iran and the United States. And apparently, these, these negotiations were happening on US soil, which is how they're differentiating it from previous negotiations. It will involve sanctions relief for Iran and will allow Iran to export up to a million barrels of oil per day a month in return for ceasing uranium enrichment beyond 60% and re-engaging with the IAEA. We're recording here uh, Thursday morning, 1138 New Orleans time, uh, oil's down over 3%. Um, I think maybe in expectation that this might actually be real. You've seen this. Um, it's been in the Middle East. Eye. It's also been in Haaretz and some of the major Israeli publications, which also makes me sit up in my chair a little bit more straight. Um, it also comes in the context of earlier this week, you know, the, Sa the Saudis said that they were going to cut another million barrels of oil per day in terms of production. OPEC extended its cuts from the end of 23 to the end of 2024. Still oil prices, by the way, not even reacting that much to that. 
Um, so I just thought we'd start there for a couple minutes and, and talk that through. Um, I say that I, I, I started with the joke about the 20 second stick in the eye because literally for God, what, two years now, I've been saying it makes no geopolitical sense for Iran and the United States to have the level of hostility in the bilateral relationship that they currently have. And I thought last year that after um, Iranian elections and after Raisi had been in power for a little while, that Iran and the United States would return to the JCPOA. And I would I would count that along with my prediction that Russia was not going to invade Ukraine as my two worst predictions um, from last year. So part of me thinks this is just another stick in the eye. And then, you know, the other part of me, the intelligence brain in me says, nope, we have, we have to go look in the slit and look at what's going on in the insane asylum, because what if they're actually agreeing uh, to this thing that you've been talking about forever? Um, so I don't know. I, I just thought we'd lay it out there. Do you have any other thoughts or we can just lay that out there as sort of the first salvo before we get into thinking about the rest of the year? Well, I have a lot of questions for you. I mean, can you Great. tell us a little bit about, um, you know, what is your sense of the incentives here? Is this, what do we think about when we analyze whether this is going to happen and why would the Iranian regime want it to happen or not happen? Talk us through that. Well, the argument for Iran has been the same for a while now, which is their economy really sucks and their economy has sucked for a while. And, you know, at the end of last year, we were getting those very serious protests throughout the country. And yes, it started over the death of a Kurdish woman who didn't want, want to wear a headscarf. But those protests metastasized in large part because you have really high inflation in Iran. You even had Iran stop reporting inflation for a while because apparently excuse me, things were so bad, you know, food prices up, energy insecurity, bad weather and drought. Um, and all of this is because Iran really can't access global markets. And it's nice that Iran wants to make some kind of logistics agreement with Russia to become Russia's new path to the world's oceans. Okay, but that's going to take many years. And it's also very pie in the sky. And Russia's a historical competitor. Uh, then you have to deal with, you know, is are Iran and Saudi Arabia um, making nice as a result of China stepping in and saying, oh, we need these sides to get better together. And Iran may be betting on this multipolar world with, um, with Russia and China. So that's sort of the I Iranian logic. The US logic has always been to pay less attention to the Middle East, to have a stable balance of power in the region so that one power can't dominate. Um, so it doesn't want Turkey or the Saudis or Iran or anyone to be the one dominant power in the region. It wants to have all these different powers balancing against each other. And the thing is, if you continue to kneecap Iran's economy, you're basically opening the door, opening the door for Turkey um, or some kind of Sunni power to really be the dominant um, power in this entire region. So if you're thinking long-term grand strategy, um, from the United States perspective, you have to get over your ideological problems with Iran and you should have ideological problems with Iran. This is a thuggish, sclerotic, theocratic bunch of thugs. I just said thuggish, so I shouldn't have done that. But you know, I'm, I was trying to find $2 words to express how much I don't like the Iranian regime. But if you're trying to be like, you know, a political and you're trying to think about US grand strategy, you have to find a way to deal with Iran. And if you can deal with the Saudis, you should be able to deal with Iran too. It's not like that regime uh, is that much better in terms of its actual character. So those are the pieces on the board, but you know, for whatever reason, and I mean, it's not whatever reason, Iran has been really reticent to get back into the JCPOA. The Raisi government didn't do what I thought it was going to do, which was bow to economic pressure. It's been distancing itself, and you've had those reactionary voices in Iran have been more powerful, but maybe it's at a tipping point. Again, maybe a crazy person is a, is about to poke us all in the eye with a stick too. I mean, we, we've seen progress on negotiations before and nothing kind of happened. But that, I think, is how we would lay out um, the imperatives that would drive towards this if it's about to happen. And one of the things that we've been talking about a little bit internally and writing about is the, uh, the conflict between the IRGC and the, the theocrats in Iran. Does that change the calculus at all? Is the IRGC increasing its power and becoming more confident in its hold over the system? And do they think about things differently than the Ayatollahs would? How does that work? Well, again, this is me. That This is a theory. And it's a theory because we don't have access to good information. But I think my theory is that the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is basically trying to become a version of the Egyptian military. So it's basically a paramilitary organization that is trying to capture the Iranian state. Iran is not actually set up that way. 
the IRGC is supposed to be the defender of the revolution. And then the Iranian government itself is actually supposed to be a democracy, an imperfect democracy, but there's supposed to be real, you know, elections and responsiveness to government and this, this division between the revolution and mosque and state uh, versus the actual governance of Iran. And that has been slowly slipping over time. The IRGC gets more and more involved in politics, more and more involved in the economy. Um, under Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, if you remember those times, um, a lot of Iranian companies were quote unquote privatized, which meant which meant they were taken over by the IRGC. I've seen estimates that say the IRGC controls anywhere between 20 and 60% of the economy. It's hard to really know. Um, but the idea is that the IRGC didn't want the opening up to the West, that the IRGC is waiting for Ali Khamenei, the supreme leader, to die. And then eventually that'll be the moment where they capture the state and somebody who's aligned with the IRGC will be named the next supreme leader and they'll be able to go from there. And what they didn't want was pragmatists like Rouhani, for example, to make some deal with the West that would create enormous prosperity in Iran and that would turn against the IRGC and some of its more reactionary um, principles and the things that it's doing to dominate the economy from that point of view. Again, it's a theory. It's a theory based on imperfect information. Um, but I don't see any reason for that to change until Khamenei is, is going to die. I think you have a bunch of different sides in Iran just sort of waiting because nobody wants to go after him. And everybody knows that he's old and has shown some signs of, of sickness in recent years. And so you know, you've got the pragmatists, for lack of a better word, you've got the IRGC, you've got they're aligned with the hardliners. You also have, you know, the people of Iran, the students, the shop um, keepers, like all these other people that are there that we shouldn't forget about the actual millions of people who sometimes go out into the streets and fight these um, who, who, who are in this fight as well. So um, that's my best guess. I, I, I can't see that anything would have really changed for the IRGC. Um, I think they're probably still thinking that same thing, but maybe they think if they can get a little bit eco economic development, maybe this is a nice midway point. They can export some oil, but it's not a full on return to the JCPOA or alignment with the West. It's doing everything they were doing before. They just get a little more money into the economy and into the, into the companies they control. Maybe you can make that argument, but we don't have any evidence for that. We're just guessing. And do you think that Egypt is a, um, a potential model that the IRGC might be thinking about? Because they're a military-dominated economy. It's not a liberal economy, but they also get lots and lots of goodies from the U.S. It's possible. And I've, I've always said that if the IRGC does capture the Iranian state, like when it's captured, that is when they might be willing to deal more with the West. Uh, but the, the difference between Egypt and Iran, and between Iran and Turkey as well, um, is that in Egypt, the military is secular. In Turkey, the military was always secular as well. And the, the IRGC is not the Iranian military. It is the paramilitary group that was charged with defending the principles of the revolution, of the Islamic revolution. Um, so maybe you can jettison all that. Maybe that's not relevant. Um, but there there is a real difference there. But I do think in terms of looking at the Egyptian military's role in the Egyptian economy and how it subsequently dominates Egyptian politics, I do think that is something that the IRGC is hoping to emulate. Well, what should we be watching for to see the signposts of how things are, are likely to play out, do you think? Well, I mean, uh, there's not a whole lot. I mean, if, if we get this deal, that would tell us something. Um, but even if we get this deal in its current form that it's being reported, and it wouldn't be that big of a deal. It would basically just be a sort of temporary reprieve. Um, the more interesting actor here is the Saudis. What are the Saudis doing? Because I can't imagine this would have happened without the Saudis approving it. And the OPEC cuts would tell you also, and the Saudi oil production cuts would tell you that they were on board with it. You've also got the Saudis talking about their civilian nuclear program this week and talking about normalization with Israel being dependent on US support for a civilian nuclear program, which sounds an awful lot to me like a nuclear arms race in the Gulf, exactly what everybody wants to hear about. Um, but, you know, we'll just have to see if the deal happens or if we get poked, poked in the eye. The other thing to watch, though, is oil prices, because if you're going to get Iran meaningfully coming back to the market, I mean, I've been here talking about oil prices, you know, a couple months ago, even you, I think, were looking at me like I had three heads because I was saying, I don't know about oil prices right now. Um, but I mean, if Iran is about to return in force, you've got Libya apparently making progress on elections and they're pumping in a million barrels per day. Like you start to put together all the supply that's out there. Um Man, maybe we're heading back to 2019 oil. I don't know. That's one of the things maybe we should talk about in the in the second half of, of 2023 discussion. But 
yeah, watch for the deal and then watch for what's happening in oil and watch what the Saudis are doing. Because I do have this sense that these changes are happening because Saudi's okay with them. And the level of change that we've seen in Saudi Arabian foreign policy just in the last six months, you know, making up with Turkey, depositing billions in Turkey's, um, you know, accounts, making up with Canada, making up with Iran, like Saudi Arabia really is sort of pulling strings here. And, you know, one of the analysts on our team was Art. Yeah, there you go. And losing out on Messi. Thank you, Messi, for finally, somebody finally standing up to them. I mean, one of our analysts was arguing with me saying, this really just shows Saudi weakness. How, how are they actually going to make this work? I don't know. Like their, their coffers are full from the recent upturn in oil prices from the last year or two. And Mohammed bin Salman looks a little more seasoned and is thinking about Vision 2030. But I think they're the other ones to watch here because I doubt any of this happens if, if Saudi isn't at least pushing for some of it. Um, one last question, uh, and then we can switch gears, but China, I mean, you've written a lot in the last year or two about China playing a much bigger role in the region and how important it is to them. How does all this um, potentially affect the calculus for them? Is it a positive? Is it a negative? Is it neutral? It's a positive. The more Iranian barrels that they can import without fear of uh, sanctions or without having to do shady things in order to acquire it is good for them. And there's a reason that they were sponsoring the Iranian Saudi rapprochement. They don't care about all these internecine squabbles in the Middle East. They just want access to their resources and then they want to go home. And that maybe makes the Chinese a better partner for the region because they don't care about things like democracy and um, liberalism and human rights to the extent that the United States at least pays lip service to those things. Um, but yes, I would imagine that China sees better ties between Iran and Saudi Arabia and more legitimate Iranian barrels of oil on the market is a good thing. The country that should be hating all of this is Russia because Russia's entire thing here has been, oh, we're going to build a new corridor. We're no longer going to be dependent on Europe. We're building this corridor through Iran to the to the Persian Gulf. And that way we're going to access the world's oceans and things like that. And if Iran is basically saying, no, nah, we'd, we'd like to work with the West too. And we'd like to export our oil above board, uh, all those Russian barrels that are no, no longer available. We'd love to you know, slide a million barrels of ours <laughs> into the markets that Russia can't get to anymore. Um, anywhere you look, it just looks bad for Russia, but China, this is, this is good stuff for China. China probably wants more of this. Um, Moving on from there, I guess that was a, um, yes. So moving on from there, I thought we would zoom out a little bit and talk about, um, the rest of 2023. And I have a list of, I sort of wrote out my geopolitical forecasts for the year. We published it on the knowledge platform, but I wonder, Rob, um, do you have a sense in your mind of at the beginning of this year in January, how you thought the year was going to look just from a market perspective? Like what, what did you, what were you expecting over the 12 months? Um, and are there any things that have really stuck out to you as not happening or happening? Well, I mean, there's a lot there. Um, I think one of the biggest takeaways from the year so far is, you know, we've repeated over and over this notion that the biggest economic regions of the world are moving in very different ways. Mm. And that's new that had never happened before. Um, and I think this year has just shown more evidence of that. So, I mean, if you were just to look right now, the US is in an expansion and slowing down. China had been in COVID lockdown and, you know, saw this burst of activity as it came out. And now it's fading away. And the question is, how badly does it fade? And Europe uh, is in a recession, uh, a mild recession sort of a technical recession. Um, but everyone is in a very different place. Um, and that's something, again, you know, for those who who underestimate this, that's almost never been the case before. So um, when you're analyzing these things, you know, everyone was focused on the Chinese reopening at the start of the year. And okay, well, how big can it be? How, uh, how, how many, you know, how much pent up demand is there? How many Chinese with money are going to want to be traveling to Europe and to Japan as tourists because they've been cooped up all this time? Um, and that anal analysis was very siloed. It was all like the China analysts were focused on that. Um, but not really thinking, you know, you never saw anyone who was looking at the U.S. and analyzing the U.S. Uh, cycle, 
you know, what is the impact of the second largest economic region in the world having a sudden reopening, you know? So I think putting that into, into one's toolkit is really important because we're so used to everything just moving together, analyzing the U.S. is de facto analyzing Europe and analyzing China, but it's really not the case anymore. I think that's a big takeaway from, from the year so far. Yeah, and that's a nice sort of segue into the into the geopolitical part of it because um, you might remember that I the way I structured our 2023 geopolitical forecast was three different scenarios, and I talked about unipolarity, bipolarity, and multipolarity. And we talk about multipolarity all the time, and that's the fancy geopolitical word, the stupid geopolitical. It's it's a three dollar word, and I don't have the fifty cent word for it. And listeners, I'm still on a quest to find the fifty cent word for this concept. So if you have any ideas, please feel free to write in and let me know. I'm tired of using the word multipolarity. Um, but to your point, if different economies have different interests, like geopolitically, that's also going to be relevant, and that's going to affect things. But we also laid out, okay, what happens if we're wrong? What if we head towards a bipolar world, and what if we are heading towards a unipolar world, where the United States or China or some other power um, is the dominant power going forward? And we put some signposts there. We talked a little bit about how it was going to be a year of major weakness for the Chinese economy. We talked about how it was a make or break year for the European Union, that this was the year we needed to see real progress on things like EU structural reform. And we, we didn't want to see squabbling between East and West and North and South and frugals and profligates. Um, two of the more um, out there predictions were that we would see the end of Russia or at least the end of this Russian regime before the end of the year and maybe a regime change in Iran as well. I think that Iran regime change one, it doesn't look very good, although the Russia one, maybe we could talk about a little bit. And then um, we talked about the rise of Turkey and we talked about um, really volatility in energy markets and then a plateau in agricultural commodities and food prices, both of, both of which I feel good about here sitting at the halfway point of the year, but we've got six more months before I can take any before I can take any victory laps. Um, the, the part of the forecast that is probably... Um, well, th th there's two parts that I'm, I'm a little bit worried about. I think the unipolarity thing is off the table. None of the signposts that we had for unipolar world, the United States or China or anybody else dominating are off the table. Um, but we have seen some, some signposts that are a little ambiguous with the bipolar world versus the multipolar world. Um, and there's two in particular. The first is I have not been overly impressed with the European Union this year, and I've been very bullish since we started this podcast, we've done, what, 100 plus episodes now, and I've been very bullish about the European Union, and I don't like what I'm seeing at all. I mean, we've, we've got more arguments and squabbles between East and West. Maybe that'll change with Polish elections in, in October of this year. Maybe that will be, if you can get a pro-EU government in Poland, maybe things are going to turn around then. But so far, first six months of the year, it hasn't looked very good. And Although there have been some sort of minor steps forward, you don't see good EU reforms. You see more problems with Hungary and Poland. You see, you know, Italy and France butting heads. We're, we're just not seeing the level of progress that I would have hoped or expected to there. And I really do think it's a critical moment for the European Union. And the second, and this is something I put on the knowledge platform today, um, you know, in a multipolar world, you need other powers, other centers to rise and to be not aligned with either the United States or China. And one of those big powers is India. India, which has elections coming up in 2024 and is heading into a major part of its political cycle. And um, India-US relations have had a really good six months. There's cooperation on supply chains. There's apparently going to be a delegation. Maybe they're going to talk about trade coming up in a couple of weeks. There was um, Kurt Campbell, who's a high-level Biden official, who's head of the Indo-Pacific, talking about how India is the most important bilateral rel relationship that the United States has and hoping that the upcoming visit will, quote-unquote, he used the word consecrate <laughs> the India-US relationship as that top, top relationship. So big words there. All of which is to say, if, if India is really going to align with the U.S., and, and I don't think it will, but if it did, you know, I, I would really have to start thinking, uh, I don't think you throw out multipolarity at that point, but that's one major poll that we sort of have to re-examine. On the flip side of that, Turkey doing very well, Brazil asserting itself and looking like a major power as well. So I'm not saying we need to throw out multipolarity, but I will say like that that division between is it a bipolar US China Cold War and it's everybody either you're with the Chinese or you're with the US or is it that true multipolar different power centers different regions around central powers um I think that's still kind of a little bit up in the air and you know some of those forecasts and indicators that we talked about are are the things that I'm watching for going forward Yeah the European Union thing I think is the biggest um disappointment so far that's totally right 
Um, and in part, it seems like, I mean, we've been talking about this since we first met each other. This was, I think how we initially bonded was, oh, I'm, I'm bullish on Europe. You are too. Like, let's be friends because <laughs> it was a very lonely place to be. Um, but, uh, but certainly this year, the urgency behind unification behind kind of cooperation seems to have lost some of its force. And I wonder if that's mostly because the war had kind of been put on ice for some period of time. And that, you know, as you talked about earlier this week, um, that might be changing now. Um, and also the energy crisis, which was a non-crisis, Yeah, you know, all of this momentum to do stuff and work together and cooperate. And then, Hey, you know, the weather's nice and things are okay. And, um, let's let's allow our petty squabbles to rise to the surface again that seems there seems to be a bit of a of a yo-yo effect here and maybe you'll see it move in the other direction again if the war changes or the next inevitable bad thing emerges but so far it's it's not trending in that direction as you say well if, if we were going to take the the opposite point of view and say well have, have there has there any silver lining have there been any signals that we like this year at all I will say it looks like France and Germany, after a rocky start to the year, they look to be on the same page. And if Scholz and Macron and if Berlin and Paris are on the same page, that can paper over a lot of other divisions within the European Union. So we, we'd want to see a lot more of that. I think we've just sort of seen signals that Germany and France are on the same page. But that is at least a silver lining and something to hang our hat on. I think you're absolutely right that the Russia-Ukraine war has sort of become old news in Europe. It's now it's, oh, it's this battle in Bakhmut. It's in far Eastern Ukraine. It doesn't really affect us because it didn't affect us from the energy perspective, this, that, or the other thing. If Ukraine really is gearing up for this counteroffensive, you've got the breaking of this dam this week. You know, people are starting to pay a lot more attention to it. You've got, you know, the German government, other European government offering lots of weapons and long-term commitments for defending Ukraine. I think in part because they see the economic potential of integrating Ukraine into the European Union. Um, there's a lot of potential there. And then, you know, last couple of weeks, we've also seen some major changes with both the EU and the US and how they're dealing with Kosovo, because apparently they see, uh, well, if Russia's weak here, suddenly Serbia is now on the table. And suddenly, let's just, as Marco said on the podcast um, earlier this week, let's just roll up the Balkans. Like, what are we waiting for? We can have a little, it's not huge, but, you know, these are tens of millions of people. Maybe we can have a little shot in the arm there too. Um, I think the real hinge point for me is going to be Polish elections coming up because one of the reasons i i think last year things went so well for the european union was because poland and hungary which before then had been the euro skeptics kind of ganging up against brussels together they broke apart a little bit because hungary was i don't want to say pro-russian but certainly not anti-russian and wanted to be much more pragmatic towards moscow than everybody else in europe in the context of the war whereas for poland which before had enjoyed um, Hungary's Euro skepticism suddenly said, what are you talking about? Like Russia's the biggest threat to the entire bloc. We've been talking about this forever. Like you, you can't actually be serious that now that the war has happened, you're also, you're still going to, uh, bat your eyelashes at Putin and expect cheap natural gas. Um, that's turned a little bit, maybe in part because Poland's not so afraid anymore. Maybe they can see it kind of going forward, but Poland has also, despite it being one of the most, uh, Europhilic countries in the bloc, if you just look at polls, haha, um, uh, the government has been more Euroskeptic and has been pushing back against Brussels and they're on the ballot in October. The, if you look at the, the, the numbers right now, the Polish government, it looks like, I mean, they're still the, the, the PIS, the party looks like they're still the top dog for now, but certainly their voter share has declined a little bit. Um, can the opposition figure it out? Could you get a pro EU Polish government and sort of, I think that's one major thing to, to look for. So it's not, it's not all bad, but, um, you know, the flip side of that is we could talk about France and Italy arguing about migrants or about Germany saying Hungary shouldn't take over the uh, EU Council presidency. I mean, there's lots of other things there that cut in the opposite direction. But again, you know, we talk about often, what do you pay attention to? <clears throat> and a lot of this is looking at sort of political developments. What are people saying? What are they arguing about? Um, if you look at the actual data there's a lot of things going on in Europe that I don't see anyone really talking about mm. that, uh, that are much more positive, just to take that more positive view and why I'm still fundamentally bullish. Like, I think I still have the thesis and probably you do 
as well. You know, it's just the thesis is taking a few punches to the chin. Yeah. Um, and I mean, for example, Italy is having a construction boom right now. Mm. Like no one's talking about this, but if you look at the data in Italy, they're killing it. They're absolutely killing it in terms of, you know, everything construction related, um, sort of levels of business confidence around that area, fixed to asset investment, that sort of thing. Um, France has seen a uh, cyclical slowdown, you know, just like Germany has. Germany's been even worse. But the thing that's interesting is if you look at business confidence in a place like France um, or Italy for that matter, even though they've had this slowdown, business confidence remains unusually high. And if you look at what uh, businesses are saying when they're surveyed on, well, what do you, what is your outlook on the overall economy and other businesses? It's much more negative than when they're asked, well, what is your outlook for your business? And that's a very, very positive number, even though the economy has slowed and you're, you know, you had the energy issues of last year and cyclical slowdown and technical recession. There's something that's fundamentally different there in terms of animal spirits uh, that we haven't seen really ever. And I think that's worth thinking about, um, especially in the context, you know, you mentioned Poland and Hungary. Um, I actually met with uh, and had lunch with a really great emerging markets investor last week who focuses on Eastern Europe. And he was, he was pretty bearish on uh, Poland in, uh, because of the politics. Hmm. And he noted, you know, well, Poland, they may not benefit so much from Ukrainian rebuilding because they're really tied into the German supply chain and, and it doesn't really extend that much. Um, but uh, if Ukraine is going to be the frontier, you know, the bulwark against Russia or, you know, crazy scenario, but if Russia does have some kind of regime change and you get a liberal, you know, government of some form in there and everyone starts licking their chops about, oh my God, now Russia's on the table. I, I guess what I'm saying is there's a lot of scenarios where you can see people getting their animal spirits up about the prospect of extending out that German industrial supply chain farther east, you know, building Ukraine up again, incorporating them into, you know, the German supply chains. Maybe Ukrainian companies supply the Polish companies, which then supply, you know, at a higher value add, the German companies, which then export it all. Um, there's a lot to think about there. Um, but change i think is the the most reassuring thing uh, change shaking up the europeans and also giving them a kick in the ass to to invest and and do stuff yeah i mean this is also you know we talk all the time about how um, national economies are not the same thing as markets and you know politics is also not the same thing as economics so things could develop very well here economically and still uh, be bad politically. That might be bad in the long term, uh, but you know that can still happen in the short term. And maybe economics will lead politics rather than politics leading economics. Um, looking ahead to the sort of second half of 2023, um, what's on your list, or do you want me to start with my list, Rob? Because th there's a couple. I, I, you know, I'm still kind of working this out. I haven't fully written my second half of the year forecast quite yet, but I've got a couple things on the dartboard that I still I'm feeling pretty good about that I can raise. But I wanted to ask you first. Um, what your second half of the year looks like or what you're looking at, whether from a market or political perspective, um, what do you think is going to be most important here in the second half of the year? Um, in the U.S., I think really the rubber is going to hit the road on our thesis that you can have durable U.S. economic growth and asset markets that don't do well, um, both because corporate profit margins contract and inflation remains higher than people expect because of that growth. Interest rates remain higher than people expect. Risk premiums go up because the volatility of inflation mm -hmm. is higher, because the volatility of in interest rates is higher. All of those things, that's sort of our base case. Um, so that's gonna, gonna come to the test um, in part because I think, you know, we've been saying for a long time, you know, several months at least now that we see scope for the US economy to really accelerate more than people expect. Um, and you're starting to see that like in commercial construction, for instance, we put this on the knowledge platform this week, commercial construction in the U S is absolutely booming right now. 
absolutely booming. Everyone is focused on residential and housing starts and their you know response to interest rates. Manufacturing uh, construction in the U.S. was up eight percent month over month uh, in the most recent month. I mean, it, it's exploding. So a lot of that is the Inflation Reduction Act. A lot of that is just companies investing um, to build out supply chains and all the things that we've talked about. But there are definitely green shoots in the U.S. And if I'm right, you'll see that and you'll see rates remain higher and equities will continue this sort of bleeding bear market that we've seen since the bubble popped a year ago. Um, in Europe, I think the thing that I'm most focused on is peripheral Europe. So we've been shifting more of our portfolios and more of our weightings into peripheral Europe, uh, Italy, Greece, places like that. And the markets are outperforming and the economies are performing really well. Um, so will that continue? And what does it mean for the broader uh, for the broader block, I guess, is the big question that I would have because I'm, as you know, a believer that Mr. Market sort of shows you the way before often you have a rational thesis to explain exactly what's mm -hmm. going on. Um, so that gives me hope. Uh, and then, you know, elsewhere, the China issue, uh, I'm, I'm much more worried about China um, now. I mean, we, we, we've been very worried about China. We did the piece, I think it was last August or September, talking specifically about the, the housing market and, and the sheer scale of it. Um, I think people are still just way too complacent about the, the scale of the problems that China faces and the potential outcomes that you could see um we're anchoring onto a much more stable recent past and the outcomes are not in that narrow of a range they're way wider than people um are assuming and and that's what i worry about uh, a lot is in the second half of this year do you see a deterioration there um so those are those are my big ones for the big three regions. Yeah, and and for me, I, I'll start with with China as well because I mean that is one area where I was pretty dead on at the beginning of the year. So far, it's looking good. I said that China would be driven by weakness and that it was going to go from I, I didn't know what sector it was going to be, but you know, we had the tech crackdown, we had the property developer crackdown. It looked to me like China was really going to suffer from a United States that was going to take more action against it from the trade war perspective because Biden was going to be facing a divided Congress. Like I was expecting bad things out of the Chinese economy. And it's becoming clear that it's going to be local government debt. I think that's going to be the big issue here for the second half of the year. And I think that that is going to crowd out any optimism on China's reopening. You might even get some better indicators out of China's reopening, especially if things go well in the United States and the, you know, the manufacturing cycle and all these other things. But I do think that that's going to crowd things out. I don't think the sky is going to fall, but I do think that that's the thing that's probably going to be dominating China's policies going forward and may make China more open to at least the rhetorical shift in the Biden White House about improving ties. Although when you actually look at, you know, the Biden White House seems to be saying they want to talk more to China. And yet, you know, just today, we've got China's putting up some kind of listening post in Cuba, giving them billions of dollars. Um, you've got the United States agreeing to put naval drones on the same network with Taiwan and Japan. Like you just go through the news. Like there's no there's no real thaw. There's just a thaw in terms of how the United States is talking about things. And I think the White House thinks that if it talks about things differently, things are going to go like it's not. But I don't think China is going to be able to push back for those issues. Um, the second thing, and this is more controversial, and it's it's less certain because I don't know if we're going to see the end of Russia um, at the end of this forecast period. But I will say I'm expecting Ukrainian success with the counteroffensive going forward. And you heard the counterfactual from Marco who thinks the counteroffensive really isn't there. But I'm, I'm more hold with Sim on this. And I, I think we're going to see significant Ukrainian success going forward. At the very least, we're going to see a lot more violence and a lot more fighting in eastern Ukraine. I don't think that what we've seen for the past five or six months is going to hold. And I am worried about what that looks like from Russia's perspective and what Russia's retaliation will be. I think that that breaking of the dam in southeastern Ukraine I mean, that's one sort of, that, that's just the, the flavor of the types of things that Russia might have to do um, if it really is feeling desperate. And that's going to have follow-on effects. And that's why when we start looking at things like agricultural commodities and energy commodities, remember, I, at the beginning of this year, I, I didn't say up or down, I said volatile. 
Uh, and we have had some volatility there. Um, I'm a little more worried now, halfway through the year, about agricultural commodities because you start putting together, well, China's having really bad weather and it looks like their crop's not going well. You've got El Nino shifting things. You've got a civil war in Sudan. Now we've got Ukraine's agricultural ministry talking about millions of tons of crops going away because of the dam breaking there. You start to put the pieces together um, a little bit worried from that perspective. Energy, I'm, I'm a little less worried about. Obviously, um, I think the oil market is oversupplied. Um, but, you know, if we are in a new weather pattern, what if we get a really, really hot summer and here in the United States? What if we get a super cold winter in, in Europe? Um, things have been a little too, I guess, stable there for a little while. But it, it's hard to establish direction with any confidence. All I'm, I, I really feel like is we're going to see more volatility in peaks and valleys. So those are some of the things I'm looking for for the, the second half of the year. I don't have anything to venture on the Middle East just because... Um, you know, like we're going to have to see how these things go with this potential Iran deal and things like that. And I don't have a whole lot to say about Latin America. I will say the other narratives that you should have in mind as the year goes forward, we already talked about Poland's elections, really crucial to our EU thesis and what's happening the rest of the year. Three other elections, though, to sort of have in your mind that I guarantee will hog up some of the news cycle in the second half of the year. Pakistan has to have its elections by October 12th. Uh, and that's going to be really, really messy, especially with what's been happening with Imran Khan, especially with their negotiations with the IMF and their balance of payments crisis. Argentina has elections coming up this year. Another basket case of an economy where we might see a shift away from sort of neo Peronism of Alberto Fernandez, maybe back to more center right. I don't know that it's going to make that much of a difference, but you know, a chance for political instability there, or at least something different. And then um, in December, we've got. We, we think we have elections in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And this is one thing I keep on banging on the table about in the global sit rep. If you're reading it, like the fighting and all of the things that are happening in Eastern DRC, which that's where most of the world's cobalt is. Uh, DRC is now the second largest exporter of copper in the world that overtook Peru um, at the end of last year. Uh, and now you're going to throw an election into this entire situation. Uh, you know, DRC is a place where not a lot is changing and it has an effect global supply chains, but when it does, you'll feel it really intensely and just sort of, you know, looking forward into 2024, because I think that these uh, three major countries are having elections in 2024 and you're beginning to see that, uh, the political cycle in these countries start to change. India, Mexico, Indonesia, all countries that were relatively bullish about compared to the rest of the world, but which are heading into major political cycles. And you're already starting to see, for instance, Mexico's foreign minister resign this week because he wants to devote his time 100% to participating in the next Mexican election. So that's a little bit further down the road, but expect to see things in those countries as we get more into the election season. Um, anything else you want to say about recap or looking forward before we hit our last topic, Rob? Um, no, I don't think so. Other than just to sort of reiterate on, on China, which I think, you know, maybe gets to, uh, some of the other things we want to talk about, which is, um, I guess, a, a, a few things. First, I think it's easy to forget that the local debt issue is also, uh, is also the yeah. housing issue and the property issue. Um, and really the ultimate thing here you know, as far as the way to think about it is, you know, as Walter Baggett famously said, financial crises don't destroy capital. They just reveal the extent to which it's already been destroyed. Yeah. And um, China is a much less wealthy country than it looks on a net basis because they've destroyed a lot of their wealth uh, through this model. And I think one of the biggest moral questions and sort of psychological questions for the remaining six months of this year, and especially for 2024, is how do the Chinese people react to that? You know, um, there's kind of this view of uh, that, that you hear a lot where there's, there's supposedly this compact where, oh, well, the Chinese people will put up with authoritarianism as long as they get rich, um, you know? as long as growth stays above whatever percentage you want to you want to put on there they'll put up with anything because they don't care um and you know stephen kotkin uh who i really like he was giving a uh, a lecture recently and he said you know this is a myth he said because if the growth doesn't show up it's the xi jinping regime is not going to turn around and say well i'm sorry we failed our side of the bargain 
um, you know, we're going to now give up our position and, and hand things over. And, and I think we're sort of getting to that point where there's going to be bigger questions being asked about how, how does the regime respond? How do people respond? Because things are, are not getting better there in a very big way. Um, and that's, I think, my biggest worry. And on a sheer human level, maybe the biggest question around right now. Well, and the way I would problematize that is, you know, no, you're absolutely right that the local government issue affects the housing sector. But it's not that China went after housing last year. It's that they went after the property developers. So, um, you know, 21 was they went after the tech executives. So guys like Jack Ma who were bucking directives from the, from the Chinese Communist Party about what role tech companies were going to play in China's grim economic future, you know, the, what you're sort of describing. Um, last year, it was the property developers that really took it on the chin because Xi Jinping was not happy that some of these developers didn't listen to what his directives were in 2018 and 2019 about speculation. And what surprised the market was that he was willing to let those developers who went against the rules flail around and even go bankrupt. Um, those that followed the rules got plenty of support uh, from the Chinese government and things like that. But it was really a political thing. And with local governments, it's also a political thing. We're talking about local government cadres. We're talking about provincial officials, bureaucrats who are maybe not listening to directives from the Chinese government about how to change when it comes to financing vehicles or housing or things like that. The, the point I'm making here is that it's all political. The housing issue in China is not going to go away. Like that's going to be there no matter what. And China, I don't know how China is going to figure that out. They're going to have to try like their best case scenario, as we've said before, is doing what Japan did in the 90s, having a lost decade, you know, keeping some level of prosperity and redistributing it without the whole system going up. But if we get to the point where China is having to pull out emergency measures to save the housing market, because the things that it's doing on the political side are causing you know, that social economic fabric that you're talking about to come apart, then things are going to go badly. It's more about that. It's more, I think what's going to happen here in the second half of the year, and it's going to affect markets and sentiment about China, but it's more about the Chinese Communist Party saying, you know what, we don't have as good a control on these provinces and these local government, government officials as we want. So we're going to have to really bring them to heel and make them understand that when we say, hey, we know we have a problem, but no more. Hey, don't compound the problem. Don't do this. It's not business as usual. Um, it's that that interplay between politics and economics that is is to me going to define the rest of the year. Um, if we get to your doomsday scenario, you know that means China has failed in aggregate, and we're looking at a challenge to the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party. Which it's on my bingo card, but it's not a high probability thing. But you know, it's also one of those things: low probability, but absolutely huge magnitude if it happens. So you have to pay attention to it. Well, I, I guess the only other thing I would say on that is um, uh, I'm really not a doomsayer here at all. Um, but the one thing that I do feel very strongly about and have a high, high conviction view on is just the idea that we're, we're, we're mischaracterizing the way this is going to play out. Right. So we look at like the, the way that the Chinese system has developed in the last 10 years, for example. Right. And we just assume, like, if you look at anyone's projections for housing prices, for growth, or whatever it is, it's it's all linear. And and I guess the point I would make, you know, which we talked about in the treadmill to hell episode, is this is an exponential system. It's an exponential system that requires acceleration to continue. So when you have a housing bubble, you need acceleration. Otherwise, like, it doesn't just roll over. It either accelerates or it collapses. And in many ways, the local government debt issue is very similar because local governments have been feeding off of the housing bubble, seizing land, selling it, seizing land, selling it, seizing land, selling it. And that's the treadmill. That's the exponential um, sort of bubble dynamic where, you know, and, and there's a, actually a French guy named Didier Sornet who writes really elegantly about this. And he goes through the actual math of this where it's rational to create the system as long and to participate in it as long as you have an expectation that it's going to accelerate. Um, and, and that I think, you know, we talked about the banking crisis, quote unquote, in the US and, and how, you know, this is no Lehman and how it's really stupid. And I, I think that's kind of proven to be right so far. 
you know, if you want to know what the sort of Lehman moment is, it's it's in China. And it's because of the unanticipated connections between things and the exponential changes between things, which is what happens in a in a crisis. Right. So that's why I say like everyone, oh, I'm bearish. Well, I think prices could be down 8%. Well, I'm bullish. I think they're up 5%. Like it's not going to be a normal outcome because the system isn't set up that way. That's why I worry because if you do get the bad side of that and it doesn't accelerate and they don't get back on the treadmill and the treadmill has a monkey wrench stuck in it, then the the natural outcome of that is much, much worse than than even the more bearish people yeah. assume. You know, that was well said. Um, and even even me, who is, you know, I, I think that China will f- muddle through. I, I think the reckoning is coming, but I, I don't think it's quite here yet. But even me, like, like, yes, like, and that kind of risk is especially prevalent when, you know, they've gone after tech, they've gone after property developers. Now you're going after, you know, the folks that are actually in charge of controlling politics in these different provinces and regions. It's a different kind of problem. And, um, you know, like that, that's sort of the monkey wrench, like you're really opening up a lot of potential possibilities. If you're going to go on a political, you're not going after the corrupt businessmen, you're not going after the tech, you know, you're, now you're going after the real sort of nuts and bolts of the Chinese communist party system. So, um, before we close Rob, and I know we have to go cause we've got a meeting with our team here in a couple of minutes. Um, but there was an article in nation, uh, the title of which is the illusion of moral decline. It was written by Adam Mastroianni. Sorry if I butchered that and Daniel Gilbert. Um, Maybe the most important thing I've read this year, um, we'll put a link in the show notes. Um, the cliff notes is that um, there's, and the title is that, the illusion of moral decline. So that everybody thinks that morality is declining all over the world. And actually, the data suggests that it's not declining at all. And the way that this is obviously subjective a little bit, but the way they talk about this is in their surveys, if you ask people, are things less moral now or more immoral compared to 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago? The answer is yes. And the further back your short, your time horizon, the more, the more immoral it has become. But if you ask them, did you help somebody with their groceries today? Did you feel disrespected today? Do you think your friends are immoral? Your family are immoral? The answer is no, everything's fine. And my thing is just that in the grand scheme of things, we're losing morality. And they point out, well, how can you have morality is declining and yet morally today everything is fine there's some kind of disjuncture there and they they posit two things the first they call is a biased exposure effect and that is um, a fancy way of saying people really like negative news they are fed by and want to find negative things out about the world so you want to watch the local news and who was murdered or who stole money from this or what is the corruption scandal all those other sorts of things um, and that we have this this bias to seek out that negative information and that the media companies that are out there have a bias to continue feeding it to us because that's how they actually make money and get their clicks. And then the second psychological um, thing that they were talking about is a biased memory effect, which is that we tend to forget or at least misremember bad things that happened to us. We we gin up what the past was. We, we don't remember how bad things were in the moment. Sometimes we even forget that things were bad at all. We look back 10 years and say, oh, wasn't that great? And it was like, uh, you know, somebody will be at there at times that uh, you actually hated it at that time. Don't you remember how terrible things were? And they have a nice little acronym for this. They call it BEAM, um, the biased experience and memory effector somehow. Um, but their, their whole point is that there is this illusion of moral decline. And it's because we latch on to negative information and we have more negative information and more avenues to consume negative information than ever before. And yet we also tend to misremember that things were negative at all. Um, so you get this weird sort of juxtaposition where we want negative things, but then once they've happened, we forget that they were that negative, but then we still keep consuming the junk food or the the, the drug rush that is the sort of negative side effect. And there's a lot of different ways you could apply this. I think, you know, you, you mentioned in a Slack, I'm, I'm eager to hear what you have to say about applying this from an economic point of view. I think you can apply it to a geopolitical point of view too. I mean, I, I get calls multiple times a week, oh, the world, it's really going to hell in a handbasket. And I keep on saying, it's really not that bad. Um, this, this week, for example, is the uh, was the week that D-Day happened um, when the United States, you know, in, invaded Europe to try and conquer the Nazi war machine. I'm sitting here in New Orleans drinking coffee and talking to my friend in Paris rather than, you know, getting ready to storm the beaches of Normandy. Seems pretty good to me. Doesn't seem like the world's ending to me. Um, but I, I do think we have this negative, that, that, I don't know, it, it really struck me that we have this illusion of 
moral decline, geopolitical decline, economic decline, and that the way that our consumption models for information are set up right now, they're rewarding these things. And the last thing I just want to say is that the reason I wanted to talk about it and the reason I think is that it's so important is it really doesn't matter if they can prove that it's an illusion. If people start to actually believe this, and if nations start to actually believe this, that the, that we are getting more immoral, it suddenly opens up all kinds of different um, justifications for state behavior about, well, how do we compete for resources? What is What do we think that China's real intentions are with Taiwan or with a listening post in Cuba and things like that? If you really think everything's declining, it doesn't matter if somebody writes a paper that I think is brilliant and shows that it's an illusion. The illusion becomes real because people are phenomenologically experiencing it in real time. Um, so I don't know, it, it just really, really struck me. And I think it has a lot of different, um, I'm definitely going to like start talking about it in some of my <laughs> speaking gigs. It gave me vocabulary for something I was feeling viscerally, uh, and couldn't quite describe, but I wonder how you react to it, Rob. Um, well, first I, I wonder about the media explanation. Uh, it might be part of it, but if you look back, I mean, even before the age of mass media, people have been saying this since the beginning of time. Like even if you go back to, you know, the Bible or Herodotus or classical authors, they're like, oh, you know, back in the day, people were giants and their legs were like this big <laughs> and they strode over the earth. And now are these shriveled, pathetic losers. And um, so I don't think that's a that's a new thing um, that's that's really due to media. Uh, I guess that would be one one observation. Um, the other thing is. You know, it is reassuring because it, it does show you that, and, and we get this a lot, people calling in and saying, you know, God, I'm really worried about the world going to hell in a handbasket. And we have to kind of reassure them that things are great and, you know, you need shades because the future is so bright and all, of, you know, the stuff that, that we can talk about because we're digging into the good stuff uh, as well. Um, but at the same time, I think it, it does reveal the, the fragility of some of these things. Um, and it's not a necessarily a global thing, and I think it could be on a region by region basis. But this does get to the to the Chinese uh, issue that I was going on about before, which is, you know, the Chinese people have anyone who's our age in China, they've lived through an incredible time. Like I don't think anyone could have said like the last forty years in China have not been incredible, like best time ever right and yet what happens if people are biased to see decline no matter what what happens if if things start to go off the rails if you start to see a slowdown in some of these places um you know just tying this to multipolarity and sort of economic models um you know when you see sort of a breakdown of trust because people think people are immoral. They think that others are immoral. Um, that's when you tend to see a shift toward more uh, autocratic systems, towards more autarkic systems. Um, and, and that's a worrisome thing. I think that's the one thing, even though I'm super optimistic, that's the one thing that I sit around and I, I do worry about because that's the story that the fascists want to tell. The, the people who are you know, peddling these stories of moral and national decline and we have to rejuvenate, you know, Mother Russia or, you know, whatever the nation is that they're going to tell the story about. And and if people believe those because things are getting a little bit worse wherever they may be, um, that that's a, a troublesome development. And it also tends to lead to systems like, you know, you've seen in in some of these nations where they have turned inward where they've repressed households in the name of autonomy in the name of uh, autarky um that's that's something that we don't want to be rooting yeah, for yeah i i out, i underlined one sentence in this in this um in this paper which i'm going to read now because it i think it says exactly what you're saying it says specifically biased exposure to information about current morality may make the present seem like a moral wasteland biased memory for information about past morality may seem the may make the past seem like a moral wonderland and when people in a wasteland remember being in a wonderland 
they may naturally conclude that the landscape has changed. And yes, fascism is one of those words that gets thrown around way too much, but you actually can define it. And one of the definitions of fascism is an allusion to a golden age that is just beyond the reach of current society, but that we must get back to and we must purify through state control and violence and all and all these other things. We have to get back to sort of that golden age thinking. Um, the more, I guess, approachable way, and one of the reasons it's one of my favorite movies, it's, my, it's the only Woody Allen movie I really like, which is Midnight in Paris, which it you know, goes back in time and everybody has this sort of, oh, I'm looking back to this moral wonderland when everything was great. Um, and I, and you know, people may say that this happens in every generation, but I don't, I think we're at a certain point in the cycle because, um, one thing I did a couple of years ago was I was going to back and I was looking at the state of the unions for every, um, or not the state of the unions, the inauguration addresses for every U S president. And you go from, you know, even during the height of the cold war with Eisenhower and JFK and Lyndon B. Johnson, you've got this soaring rhetoric about, we will destroy pro- poverty. There will be no cancer. There will be no, no illness. It's all about these very lofty ideals. And as you sort of track over time, it goes to, we will cut regulations. We will, <laughs> we will stop terrorism. We, you know, it, there's this real decline in sort of, well, what is the future going to be like? What kind of hope do we have for change that we can make in the future and things like that? And all of that sort of puts it together. And and that's why I think you're exactly right. Like, if we keep on convincing ourselves that the good times are behind us, eventually we will create regimes and ideologies that are about trying to go after to go and get something that never actually existed. And that is the type of grift for demagogues and authoritarians um, to make use of. And we're seeing it in democratic societies. And it is also maybe one of the reasons that authoritarian countries or leaders who have authoritarian bents, even in democratic countries, are having such success right now. And um, it's it's you know it's hard for me I, I i think you're a little more optimistic than i am which is, i always say i think the next five seven years great great time for investing great time for investing in new supply chains like really really great uh, i'm a little more worried about what the world looks like for my children and for your children like eventually we're going to have to figure out how to get through this and we're either going to have to accept that the future is bright or the world is going to have some fights about the wasteland versus the wonderland um, and everybody's going to think that they're just trying to get back to their wonderland. So, um, uh, <laughs> not often for me that I'm less sanguine than the person that I'm talking to here, but I, I think on that seven, 10 year time horizon, this is something that's going to be lurking in the background that we're really going to have to face down. Well, l- let me give two tangible reasons why I'm really sanguine, at least about Europe and about the U S which might be surprising to some people. Cause I think most people assume that the U S is you know, coming apart at the seams. Um, both of them have their own unique vision of the future. And I think it's animating them, you know, culturally and economically. And and there's evidence that you can see of that today. This isn't just speculation. And in the US, I think it's very technology focused. I mean, the US, historically, our story has always been, you know, economic growth will set you free. Economic growth will redeem you. We've had religion and progress sort of tied up in this unique, you know, intertwining vision at the heart of everything that that we've done since the founding of the country. And and when I look at what's happening with technology, when I look at the optimism around technology, leaving aside, you know, the talking heads who are saying AI is going to destroy us all and everything. Like Elon Musk is the most famous man in America. Elon Musk is the man who wants to put us on Mars. That is a good thing. People want to do more. And when I see people, you know, doing startups, dreaming big, like that is, that is gaining strength and gaining power as a vision of the future that people want to build. And you can see investment happening to try to build that, whether it's in AI, like not to... (laughs) cheapen it, but look at NVIDIA's results. Like there's a vision of the future, uh, that is becoming clearer. And I think that's really powerful. And in Europe, it's, it's a bit different. Um, this is one of the reasons why I've been sort of very bullish on Europe, even though the common view is like, oh, they're stagnant. It's old world. They don't care. They just want to have their, you know, 10 weeks of vacation and drink their wine on the patio, you know, that kind of thing. And, and I, I disagree with that. And the reason is because I think more than any other place, Europe has a vision of the future that is 
um, really about sort of recreating the economy. It's about integrating nature with with economic systems more more closely. And I understand that that's you know not a right wing view, but that's a mainstream view in Europe now. And if you look at a place like Paris, for example, you can see this tangibly on the ground. Paris has planted hundreds of thousands of trees in the last two years. And if you walk through the city and you walk through some of the parks that they've built, it's like being in nature. They have water um, habitats. Like it feels like you're in a marsh in some of these places. You can physically see around you a vision of the future starting to take shape and people really believe in it and they're starting to put their money where their mouth is because they want to create that to not be like the us and to not be like the chinese because they think both of us are cheap and lame um and that's a very powerful animating vision and and i again to root this in markets and actually you know tangible stuff like you can see people building things to realize both of those visions and i think it's a very very good thing i hate to, i hate to spoil your parade but I'll, I'll just say sort of one thing and then we can i'll give you a chance to respond to it because i don't want it to be the final word but i think there is something in the fact that you know think about the things that you identified in those visions artificial intelligence nature mars none of them have anything to do with other humans we're going to interact with each other via headsets and things like that. We're going to go to another planet and destroy that one with all of our weird tendencies. We're going to have parks and nature so we don't have to interact with each other. We can like have burbling brooks in our cities and things like that. Um, one of the more interesting things about the study was it wasn't just the U.S. It was everywhere in the world people were giving the same types of answers. Everybody thought that they were living in a moral wasteland and that they wanted to get back to the moral wonderland. And I guess the point that I'm making is it maybe doesn't matter so much if there is a vision. It's if the majority of people, despite what you're talking about, despite that in the day, they can be like, oh, I love it here in the day. Like, yes, I want more nature in the day. But when they take a step back and they go home and they think about, but yeah, this world really sucks and I don't trust my neighbor because we live in an immoral universe and we really have to be thinking of, like what happens when those visions that you're talking about get turned to, ah, well, the reason that we have more nature is because we want to be sovereign from an energy and a security and environmental point of view. And we have to fight against those that would try and, you know, you start to get in there, it, it gets a little bit messy, but I take your point. I hope you're right. Well, I guess my response to that would be like, it's always been like that. It's been like that for a very long time. There's something inherently human about that. And yet we've seen such incredible progress the last two centuries. Um, despite that, despite the fact that, you know, we, we, even in periods when we've been the most pessimistic, we've nevertheless Gone We've forward. seen incredible progress and incredible tragedy. Our scale for progress and tragedy in the last two centuries, we've in both directions, we've gone in those things. But maybe we we, we bookmark it there because I know we have to go talk about a chemical company that we think is a good investment for our investors. So on that note, <laughs> oh man, what what a what a letdown <laughs> after that whole. Got to leave them wanting more. So cheers and see you out there, y'all. Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about Cognitive Investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur.